Well, hello and a very warm welcome to everyone. Um, this is our Even Break Explores event, which we hold from time to time. We've already done one on learning le the lessons from COVID with Adam Highland from Diversity and Ability, and also on intersectionality with Shani Danda. And today we're looking at learning disability. And I'm particularly keen on this subject because it's something I probably don't know enough about. We find at even break that we don't get asked very often to um, advertise supported internships or apprenticeships or supported employment roles. Um, and most of our candidates tend to go for graduate roles or, or experienced higher roles. So this is something that I think we really need to learn about at even break as well. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jane Hatton and I founded even break in 2011. Um, Even Break is a social enterprise. We're all disabled um, at Even Break, and we have three main areas of focus, all about re reducing the um, disability employment gap. So the first one is a job board, which connects disabled candidates to inclusive employers. And we also help employers become more inclusive and accessible, and today's event is part of that. And we also have a career hive, which supports disabled people looking for work um, with um, support that they might need that's relevant and accessible to them. So today I'm joined by some lovely people from a charity called Seeability. Seeability used to be known as the Royal School for the Blind and it's one of the UK's oldest charities that's dedicated to supporting people with learning disabilities or autism and many of whom have sight loss. Their vision for inclusive communities is one where people with disabilities can live, love, thrive and belong as equal citizens. I'm sure that's something we would all want to aim for. And they believe that this goal has enormous synergies with the corporate sector, um, with your aim to become more inclusive and create more diverse workplaces. And Seeability's role as a business friendly partner and critical friend. So, you know, like Even Break, we want you to make diversity and inclusion the heart of your recruitment strategy. Um, so as a thriving charity and employer of over 700 frontline and support staff, Seeability count people with learning disabilities and autism as colleagues across every level of the organisation. So they're really walking the talk. And today we're going to hear from them their unique insight on how to create inclusive workplaces and innovative work practices that enable diverse talents to shine. So when this happens, everyone feels more engaged and connected to their cause. So I'm delighted to be welcomed by um, three people. Um, Scott Watkin, BEM, is the head of engagement for Seeability. When Scott was a child in special needs school, his, his teacher told him that he would never have a job or a partner or be able to live independently. Today, Scott is married, has a family and lives in his own home. He spent his life advocating for people with learning disabilities and started a new and was awarded the British Empire Medal for his tireless work, which is pretty impressive, and started a new role as head of engagement at Seeability. This is what happens when we believe in people's potential and actively support their ambitions. We're also going to be joined by Emily Stewart, who is an influencer at Seeability. Emily is Seeability's first ever influencer. Age 34, this is her first paid job, an achievement she is rightly incredibly proud of. She knows it proves to all of those who never thought it was possible, including her mum, that with the right support and personal drive, living with disabilities does not have to reduce your horizons. And when you meet Emily later on, you'll see all of that drive and motivation that she has. She's motivated to pass on many of the skills that she's learned in her role, to others and help create opportunities to raise people's voices who otherwise might not be heard, something that she feels is very, very important. But before we hear Scott's story and Emily's story, I'm going to talk to Joni Rock. She's head of fundraising at Seeability and she brings a breadth of experience in the charity sector. Initially working in corporate fundraising, Joni secured and cultivated high profile partnerships with the likes of Harrods, BMP Paribas, Barclays and Addison Lee. She subsequently headed up a major project redesigning the strategy for community fundraising and volunteering. And in her most recent role was responsible for the attraction, recruitment, onboarding and engagement strategies of all volunteers and paid workforce across the NSPCC. 
Prior to this, Joni worked in sales and marketing in the private sector. So Joni, thank you very, very much for uh, joining us today. So lovely to see you. You too. Thanks for having us. And uh, I just thought we could open with, you know, I'm aware that the, the disability employment gap is around 30% generally for disabled people compared to non-disabled people. But when we look at people with learning disabilities, the average is something like 6% of um, people in, with learning disabilities in paid employment. And then if people have sight impairment on top of that, that's even higher. What, why do you think that might be? So um, I think there's a, a massive fear um, of the unknown. Um, and, you know, I was looking through some of the stats again last night, and it is really quite shocking, you know, so many, and this is something that the, that Seability um, did a global study on, but so many people with learning disabilities have a higher propensity to have sight loss. So those multiple disabilities have shown that the, the likelihood of them being in paid employment is even less, as you've just said, Jane. So um, I think there is a massive fear of the unknown. Um, learning disabilities can be complex um, and can be very different depending on the individual. Um, whereas physical disabilities tend to be more visible um, and therefore employers maybe feel that they know what to expect um, and know how to support somebody who has those disabilities. Um, I think that there's a lack of value in people with learning disabilities. And that again is, is probably um, down to that lack of understanding that employers might have of what those disabilities are and how to work with people who have those and work alongside people who have those disabilities. Um, and I also think that there is a lack of understanding for um, amongst um, the community of people who have learning disabilities. Um, we've spoken to a number of um, participants through our Ready, Willing and Able program um, and prospective participants who um, didn't really know that they were able to find a, a paid role. And um, so, you, you know, you've, you've welcomed Scott and Emily, you know, and you mentioned about Emily's mom, not even thinking that she would be able to ever have a paid role. And it's really changing those perceptions. It's helping them understand that that is possible for them too. Um, and it's a societal change. You know, we need to do that at both sides. We need to do that with um, people with learning disabilities and with employers so that they can open up those opportunities and be make it really clear that that's available to them too. And um, so you, you had mentioned about, about around 6% of people with learning disabilities are in work. Um, but we've spoken to a number of, of people with learning disabilities and there has been a study that shows that around 65% of people with learning disabilities really want a career um, and to remedy this challenge. Uh, you know, we need to look at those societal uh, attitudes. We need to turn that narrative around. Um, from that perceived lack of ability or perceived lack of intellect um, to seeing somebody um, with their ability um, and seeing that ability in an individual um, and the huge amount of skill, uh, dedication, loyalty um, and morale somebody with learning disabilities can bring to an organisation. Um, yes, yeah, so um, yeah, for all the reasons you just said, you know, um, we don't have enough people with learning disabilities in work and you know, what do you think that employers are missing out on when that's the case? I mean, all of this talent that's that's being unused and, and not, you know, not taken advantage of. What do you think that the employers are losing out on by not employing people with learning disabilities? Well, I think most I think so many companies are now um, you know, recognizing that employing people with uh, different abilities um, and being truly inclusive is the right thing to do. Um, I think too often they're deterred by um, doing that by, I suppose, the concern that there's a cost associated with that. Um, so we want businesses to recognize the huge commercial value that tapping into a wider pool of talent can bring um, and that embracing an inclusive workplace is, um, is a great thing to do. And, and actually by not doing it, you risk um, missing out um, in a very tough economic backdrop that we're currently facing through this pandemic and, and in life in general. Um, you may have heard of the Purple Pound, um, which is the spending power of disabled people and their families. Um, and the potential of the Purple Pound is enormous. Um, you know, it's thought that around one in five people in the UK have disabilities, um, and that's over 12 million people. Um, 
So the value of the purple pound is thought to be around 250 billion. So there's a huge risk of not, um, you know, employing people who have disabilities and being really reflective of the communities you serve. Um, so employers would also miss out on a huge talent pool, um, working alongside people with lived experience, ensuring that they're, as I say, that their business is reflective of the communities that they work in. Um, and people with learning disabilities uh, can be loyal, dedicated employees, um, and they can reduce your staff turnover um, because there's evidence to show that the, um, having um, people with lived experience in your workforce can really improve staff morale. Um, we've worked with companies like P&G to ensure uh, people with le learning uh, with lived experience um, can influence product development and product design um, through insight panels um, and creating products that are more accessible to everyone. So it's not just about um, employing people with learning disabilities or with disabilities in general. It's also about bringing them into what you're doing and working alongside them to create solutions that will support their business and and all and as I say and the people that they will be um, working with and working for within their communities. Yeah, for sure. So um, hopefully we've persuaded everyone that people with learning disabilities make great employees, and we know that. What sort of things should employers be looking to do differently if they're going to attract and retain? Um, talented, you know, disabled candidates, candidates who've got learning disabilities? Is there anything they should do differently? Uh, well, you mentioned it earlier about um, walking the walk. So, you know, there are many companies, huge companies now that are talking the talk and, and really shouting about how important it is to be inclusive. Um, and I think it's taking that step into now walking the walk. Um, and that's where working with supported employment programs um, like Seability and our Ready, Willing and Able program can really help um, so that you know that you're getting it right. Um, you know, even considering what will get the best out of candidates. So practical things like um, cons the consideration of a practical interview. So rather than um, having a sit down formal interview, showing a candidate what the job looks like in practice, Things like that, just adapting the way that you work to suit the individual um, and get the best out of them. We found that work placements can work really well for both the employer and the candidate as well, um, but only if that includes a paid job at the end. So we've had experience where um, people we support have um, had work placements in really large companies um, and nothing's come out of it at the end. And that can be really demoralizing for the candidate um, and it can feel really tokenistic, which then creates I suppose such a bad impression um, when people see that um, and then there's there's really uh, specific things like looking at opportunities to job carve and um, which some of you may have heard of before but it's um, it's used where the person can successfully undertake the majority of tasks in their job and um, but they might need elements of their duties um, taken out or that might not be possible for them to complete um, and jobs have become more flexible um, you know, we have this opportunity to use technology to our advantage and companies can look to job carve to create opportunities that work for disabled people that maybe weren't possible before. Um, you know, obviously the pandemic has created um, probably an even bigger gap in employment for people with disabilities, whether they're shielding um, or for a variety of reasons, not able to work. And we've seen that. Um, I think we've just lost Jane, but Toby and I know we've discussed that if we lose her, that you can carry on. Um, but yeah, that we've seen that, that how that's affected um, uh, so many people um, over the last year or so. Um, and irrespective of whether someone has a disability or not, job, job carving can be an important managerial strategy um, to maximise a person's skill and therefore their potential, um, rather than imposing a one-size-fits-all idea. Um, so we'd love just to kind of to wrap that up. We'd love to see more companies hiring people with lived experience um, and maybe even considering roles where they can use their lived experience to audit the way that a company works. You know, come and bring them into the workforce, look at the processes and um, look at the way that they communicate things. Is that accessible to all? Um, what are the facilities like? Are they easily accessed? Um, and, and use people with lived experience to really support um, companies to walk the walk. 
Okay, thanks, Joni. Um, on to the next question. Um, uh, have we just discussed if employees want to employ people with learning disabilities? Yeah, so the next one is about um, um, running the Ready, Willing, so, Able. Yeah, so you run the Ready, Willing and Able programme at Sea Ability. Could you tell us what that involves, please? Sure. So I am the interim head of supported employment at Sea Ability. Um, I'm currently the head of fundraising and volunteering. Um, and a day in the life is very is very mixed, varied, and um, there's a lot of juggling. Um, but in terms of what we're doing with the Ready, Willing and Able programme, it's quite a young programme. And um, we have supported employment coaches. We work close, closely with our um, participants. They work with um, companies to support them um, in any interviews that they may have with people with learning disabilities. Um, we've provided guidance and um, support um, and materials on our website, again, to support companies and to support participants. And we actively seek out new participants to join the programme so that people with learning disabilities know that actually there are possibilities out there for them to have a career um, and pointing them in that direction, helping them build their confidence, build their skill set. Um, so a lot of the work that the supported um, employment coaches do is around um, is around bringing those opportunities to life. Um, we are also looking for supported employment volunteers because we recognize to be able to grow, we want to be able to provide still one-to-one -one support with those mm -hmm. participants. So we're looking for volunteers in the near future as well. Um, we are engaging with companies, as I said, to support them in becoming inclusive uh, employers. Um, we're trying to promote the program because not everybody knows that we exist and we're really keen to spread the word that if you are an employer and you want to become an inclusive um, employer and an inclusive recruiter to get in touch and we can support you um, and uh, to reach out to people who have lived experience who may want um, a paid role to come to us and we can support you or who may even think I'm not sure whether this is for me or not but going through that three-stage participant journey where you build that confidence you build that skill level it gives you an opportunity to see whether it's right for you or not. It doesn't matter if you don't get a job at the end, but if that's not what you want, then that's fine. You've, you've built something else that's really worthwhile and fulfilling for you. And, and that's what it's all about. It's tailoring it to that individual. Um, so yeah, it's a very busy um, and there's a lot to do, um, but it's really fun. And we're really excited about what the future holds for the program and for the people that, that um, get involved with it. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm back. <laughs> I do. So sorry about that. This internet is not great here. Um, yeah, I mean, that's great. The Ready, Willing and Able programme sounds good because I know that a lot of the employers that we talk to are sometimes nervous around employing people with disabilities, you know, of, of any type. And particularly, I think people with learning disabilities for all the reasons you said before, it's not visible. It's something that's a bit, you know, more difficult to get your head around, really. Um, and yet they're missing out on so much talent. And actually, Claire made a great point in the question saying that people whose brains work differently also think differently. And this diversity of thought can bring great ideas and innovation and representation to businesses, too, that others may not think of. So that's uh, really, really good, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so uh, Rosa has asked also, what do your employers say about the supported program? What successes have they had? So as I said before, we are quite a young program um, and I think the biggest thing has been over the last year and a half, which is pretty much what uh, we've been around for, for about two years, but um, for the last year and a half, obviously we've had a pandemic and so many of the employers that were really engaged and, um, and found so much of what we did with them, either one-to-one -one support or whether it's through the guidance that we've provided on the website, they've actually... Um, struggled to continue with um, because so much of their attention and priorities has been um, geared around getting people back into work and um, getting our heads around what does furlough mean and how do I how do I get all my employees um, laptops and where do we send them to so I think that there has been a real struggle um, and I think it's only fair to be really transparent about that and hopefully and as we've seen over the last and um, few months that has started changing and we're getting so much more engagement with different businesses and um, we've we've worked quite closely with um the likes of, i think i mentioned it earlier the likes of png um and they've really engaged um with uh, the people we support and using their lived experience to help them shape how they work and um, you know 
we don't often think about it, but if you've got sight loss, how can you tell what is your shampoo and what is your conditioner if they're both oh. the same shape? You know, really basic things like that that you never really consider that actually companies are coming to us about now, big companies to, who, who you feel that would probably know about this already, but really don't. And that's fine. And it's kind of being open and prepared to accept that we not every, everybody won't know it all. Um, and you're not expected to know it all, but reach out to companies, to organizations like ourselves, and we can support you through that so that products that you develop, services you provide, they're accessible to everybody and, and there's that equity across the board that everybody that can, can access it and benefit from that company. Absolutely, definitely. And as we've said, you know, a couple of times, inclusion isn't just about disabled people, is it? Because if we look at inclusion and accessibility, everybody benefits. Yeah. It just makes things better for, for communities generally. It's not just for one specific group of people. You know, we all benefit from that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's an upward spiral, isn't it? I don't know if you found, but we've certainly found at even break that um, recently, certainly in the last few months, has been a, a much greater understanding than I've ever seen before of the need to have a diverse workforce, of what that brings. And I think it's um, couched slightly differently because I think before the pandemic, when we were talking to employers, it was very much a kind of, oh, yes, oh, what a shame. We really ought to, you know, and we'd interrupt and say, no, it's not about pity or charity. This is about talent. But now we're finding that employees are coming to us and saying, we need the talent that you represent. Yeah. And, um, you know, and I think that there is, I mean, it's taken a global pandemic to get there, but I think there is a, a, you know, a much greater awareness that actually having a diverse workforce, it makes so much sense in every sense, you know, whether yeah. it's commercial, whether it's societal, economic, um, you know, whatever it might be. And, and that's, that's got to be something that I hope, you know, lasts. And, um, and thank goodness that the Ready, Willing and Able programme is there you know, to, to support that. So how would employers um, get onto this? How would they find out more? Um, well, we've got loads of resources on our website. It depends on what a company wants. Again, we take a tailored and uh, individual approach depending on what the company needs. Um, we offer comprehensive advice, guidance, support. It can be one-to-one -one support. Um, as I say, it could be that they just access resources and materials um, through our website. Um, if, some, if a company is um, recruiting and they have any candidates who have learning disabilities, um, we can have a pre-meet um, with them um, to talk through any reasonable adjustments that need to be made for that interview. Um, and obviously if that candidate's successful, again, a pre-start meeting um, to discuss the participants' needs around training um, and again, any accessibility needs that they may have and working with that company to help them with that. Um, the supported employment coach will also support the candidate. So if they were successful in getting a job, we, would, we wouldn't just leave them once they are, are arrive in that job. We would work with them um, as much as they might need us for as long as they need us. And the same with the employer. So it's just about getting in touch. You know, if you've got roles that you think would be really suitable for people who have learning disabilities um, or disabilities in general, um, you know, get in touch and we can support you. Um, in finding the candidate that works for you. And Jane, you mentioned it earlier about, um, uh, and I think I'd said something about changing the narrative. It's not about pitying um, people who have learning disabilities. And I don't know whether anybody has seen the campaign that's launched recently. I think it's called the We Are the 15. Um, yeah. And it's really empowering. It's all about, we don't want your pity. We have skills, we have talent. We have, like Claire said, um, a different way of looking at things that can really benefit your organization. So it's just about trying to open your eyes to that. And at whatever stage you are in that process as a company, um, don't be afraid that you may be not that far along, but just touch base, you know, reach out. We would be more than happy to work with you and, um, and, and build up that confidence, that, that understanding um, and support you in that process. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because I know I've worked with companies before who've done supported internships and things like that, initially thinking this is a good CSR initiative for us. And, it, you know, it's something we should do to give back to the community. And then at the end of that program, the staff have all said, can we do this again? We've gained so much. And actually, yes, the candidates have gained, of course, because they've had experience that they wouldn't have otherwise had. But actually, the 
organization itself has gained far more than it ever expected to. So I think it's almost always a positive experience and people might be a bit nervous about it, but usually it's kind of, thank goodness we did that. You know, that was a, such a, a good experience for us. Yeah. And, and talking of, of talented people and talent um, that, that, you know, can go untapped, we've got a couple of people on the panel today who are uh, very talented as well. And, um, you know, perhaps you'd like to introduce us to Scott, who is your employee engagement manager. And I know Scott's going to tell us his story, which is absolutely fascinating. Yeah, I've been, you know, I, I've been so delighted to work with Scott over the last six months um, uh, of being at Seability. Um, and Scott's one of my peers um, in, in our team. And uh, we talk regularly, Scott, don't we? We bend each other's ears regularly. Um, and yes, I'd be delighted to welcome um, and introduce you all to Scott, who will tell you much more engaging stories than I have. Okay, thank you. And thank you for the introduction, Joni and Jane. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm just going to share my screen with you because I want to show you um, some, um, some um, pictures of me as a as a child and I'm hoping that um, this, 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 what I'm going to tell you will, will tell you that people with learning disabilities will have, um, ha do have the potential, do have the skills, skills, you just have to believe in us and, and really, and don't underestimate what we can do. So, I'm Scott Watkin, um, and I'm Head of Engagement at Seeability. Um, but actually, I'm a, um, I'm a person with a learning disability. Um, I was, when I was at birth, I was, my mum and dad were told that I wouldn't live past the age of 25. And I thought for the first six months of my life in ITU because they didn't know. Every time I went, went out of hospital, I went blue. So it must have been telling us something that I needed a bit more care and support. Um, now, I didn't know what my mum and dad were going through when they were told that I wouldn't live past the age of 25. Um, and But actually, I'm now 40 years old and I've broken down th that barrier. Um, uh, and, and so I went to a special school in London, in Lewisham. Um, so I am a Londoner, apple and pear stairs, you know. Um, and and so um, whilst I was at school, I was um, I was bullied. I used to I, at first I really enjoyed school, but actually I got to the stage where my later years of school that I didn't enjoy. It. My teachers would tell me would 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 tell me send me round the school asking for a pot of elbow grease, um, which I didn't know what that meant at the time. Um, and, and, and basically I was being told that I was lazy. Um, um, but, and, 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 the, and, 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 and the other children in school would um, bully me and I was kicked down two flights of stairs um, by uh, another child and I got up and actually I reacted, but I was bullied throughout the whole of my school life. Um, and, and they decided that um, just before my GCSEs that they were gonna uh, suspend me at school and, and, and um, exclude me uh, from doing my GCSEs um, but my mum and dad absolutely fought it and said Scott's the victim here Scott should be able to do his GCSEs why are you believe in the bullies over Scott and we and and there was a time where we nearly took 
school to court because it got that bad. They, the teachers would always see the uh, put the brighter student would would work with the brighter students and leave us us children who couldn't learn as effectively to the back of the classroom and and so I didn't achieve the GCSEs I wanted to achieve and I got the lowest grade of all but I wasn't ever to be perfectly honest academically focused in that way um, everything that I've always had to achieve was when I was um when I was, um, um, I'm trying to think of my words here, needed to be done practically. Um, so, and and that's how I look at look at my view in my life. Everything's a practical thing. View. Now, this picture here is me holding a sheet, a lamb, um, and there's one of the bullies in the picture actually uh, standing next to me. Um, and and this was um, I I was really into animals. I got I I like I I'm a very caring person, and 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 I and I could and if I'm shown what to do, and and how to hold an animal correctly, I could do that. That now after school they decided that. Um, they were going to, they told my mum and dad that, that we should go to um, boarding college. But mum and dad wouldn't have that and said, no, we're going to send Scott to normal college and not a specialist college up in Grimsby. Why, why does Scott need to go all the way up there? And the school said, well, that's the best place for Scott and his brothers. Um, but actually, it wasn't. Um, so I did go to college, um, but there was no signposting in, in either asking me what I wanted to do before I went to college as well. So because they, they didn't think people with learning disabilities could achieve like they can achieve. And the, and so I did skills for work and 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 decided that uh, I wanted to do catering, but I was told I couldn't go on the catering course because I dribble. Um, and and but all my other peers and friends did go on that course, and um, so I decided to do horticulture. Now, academically. This is the very first time that I'd ever achieved a distinction or a high grade in any of my work. And I loved horticulture until at the age of, when I was eight years old, I was diagnosed with keratoconus as well as my learning disability. And so I had a visual impairment as well. So um, the dust and the soil was affected my vision at college so I wasn't able to continue horticulture and so I had to stop doing that and they sent me to and 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 they didn't signpost me to anything else that I could be doing so I ended up volunteering at a day centre um, uh, where other people with learning disabilities were and I would help and support people with learning disabilities to pot plants. While I was there, I joined my local sound advocacy group on the Isle of Wight, and I and I was able to um, start campaigning locally. And one of my greatest achievements was to be the co-chair of the Learning Disability Partnership Board. These were all not paid roles, but I would be campaigning to make sure that people with learning disabilities were getting the support and the care that they deserved and needed. And, and, and 
but I was also shell stacking in um, in in a supermarket, and I was told one day because I broke my contact lens by accident. I was told I was an naughty boy, and um, and and I had colleagues saying to me uh, really horrible things about um, wow. Well, you, you should be standing on a street corner and things like that and um it wasn't it wasn't pleasant it wasn't nice and they just did not see the ability in me to being able to achieve but in um 2009 i was thrust into the um in i i took on my first paid role <laughs> and I represented everybody with a learning disability across the country, talking to ministers in government and leading on the government's policy, valiant people. And from that day on, my career had just flown. Um, I, I, and I think that one of the biggest things for me was I didn't know how to travel. I couldn't use email. And now I, I do everything pretty much single-handedly on my own and I have achieved that. that. And then um, and then I was made redundant from the Department of Health and I went to work at Mencap and did a short stint there to talk about inclusion and how and to support Mencap to be more inclusive as an organization. But then I also met colleagues from Seeability who saw, said, would you talk about your visual impairment and be and come and um, work with us at Seeability? And I did that. And I started off at Seeability as an ICANN vision development officer um, three days a week, moving up to um, being head of engagement engagement in 2019 19, to being able to develop and uh, a program to make sure that people like Emily and others were able to achieve but my but there, there's been lots of challenges throughout the whole of this because actually I I got married and I had a child called Jennifer, who, um, who was take, nearly taken away from us at birth because we were told that we were not able to, um, we were told that because we've got a learning disability, we can't cope. Well, actually, do you know what? It's damn, it's damn well wrong because actually we can cope and we only, we found, and we, and, and, and now we're fighting to make sure that Jennifer gets the education that she deserves and needs as well. So, um, so, and so that's really, um, um, really important. And and so in two thousand and eighteen, I won. Uh, no, in 2017, I won the Making a Difference Award for in the National Learning Disability and Autism Awards and um, for my work around eye care and visio. But then in 2018, I was awarded the British Empire Medal. For someone with a learning disability, that is that is such a big thing. You wouldn't expect to, to get a letter from the Queen um, coming through and I just thought it was fake and so did my mum at the time but I still rang the number to check if it was real um, and it was real and and so and and so that award I don't actually dedicate to my hard work and to myself I dedicate that to all the people with learning disabilities and I think it's a great uh, honour to receive that award because not many people with learning disabilities will be able to achieve in that, will not get the opportunities to achieve in that way, way because people don't, still don't see 
the potential in people and we at Seability do see that potential and we strive to make a difference. So I, I just think that the programme that I now deliver is about developing and making sure that people like Emily are next generation of leaders and are able to get the jobs, be employed, show the skills that they can learn and do the and and take the opportunities where they are where they can so thank you and that is my story um and this is my family obviously so now i want to stop sharing the screen and i'm going to introduce emily to you all Emily is an influencer, the first ever influencer in my team, and she's worked really hard to get to where she is today. So, Emily, thank you for joining us today. And shall we, shall we, shall we have a chat about your life and your career? Yes. Yes. So, so Emily. What was your childhood like for you? So I so I was born with um with hydrocephalus, which means that my fluid around my brain doesn't doesn't drain properly without a special pump. And I've also got cerebral palsy. So which means my mobility is affected a bit. But that aside, I don't let it stop me. I don't want to be one of those, I can't do it. It's, I can do it and I will do it. My mum's always said that I've been very determined. So, Emily, tell us about what school life was like for you. So, I went to a special school in seven oaks and i and i struggled with the academic side i um and i didn't always get the support that i needed if if the work wasn't done properly i would have to stay behind and do it um at home this caused many arguments because i wanted or needed help with my homework but my mum couldn't do it unless I got a printed copy as well as my braille copy, which was very frustrating as I have three older brothers. So my mum has had to support all of us at the time. It got to the point where I ripped my homework sheet up in frustration because I couldn't do it. I then decided Going home every day from school was too much and I wanted to board where I sometimes got the support I needed needed, and sometimes this was a challenge too. Okay, and Emily, while you were at school, did they ask you the opportunities that what you wanted to do in life? No, I didn't get the opportunities to be able to choose what I wanted to do in life because they didn't think I would get a job. Okay. They underestimated my abilities. Okay. And and Emily, so tell us about college. What was college life like for you? College, some of my college life was okay. Uh, I spent so two years on on a life skills program in the uh, residential college, um, which sometimes I got the support, sometimes I didn't. Um, I, I used to board at college as well. Um, and, and I remember in my last two years, the key worker was very much, no, you can do this yourself. I'm not going to keep helping you all the time with it. I then in my last two years went to mainstream college 
which I'll be honest, was hard work. I didn't get the support I needed during that time. But in order for me to have another year, they said I have to do mainstream. Okay. And so at college, did they give you any signposts into what you could do in your career or what you want other opportunities when you left college? No, because again, they thought I couldn't do, wouldn't be able to achieve anything because of my, um, because of sometimes I find it difficult to process information. Okay, and and so Emily, uh, I I'm really keen for us to fast forward a little bit now, and for you to tell us about. Um, your achievements to date so um, what's inspired you to um, to 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 get to where you are today and and how have you got to where you are today with your with with with, with your career career what was that like for you so I started off as an associate uh, I, in fact, I remember my interview very well um, because I'd like I like to see people have people with disabilities having the same um, the same opportunities as people without disabilities, just because we have have disabilities doesn't mean we don't have a voice and that's not always recognized okay so tell us about um what what you did on the program of of of, of uh, as an associate emily so we, i wrote several blogs on on how things could be improved for people with disabilities. We did a um, mini manifesto um, um, and put in there some of the things that we thought was important for other people to find out about. I've also written to the local M might not be local actually MP on things like pavement parking because because as a visually impaired person that's really important. And and Emma, thank you, Emily. And Emily, tell us about how it felt when. You when you got the role as influencer and what the, and what that process was like for you? Okay, I'll, I'll start with the process if you don't mind. Um, so um, my auntie helped me to do my application form. Um, she was brilliant at that. Um, had a lot of time to change things if I needed her to. I then did my interview while I was in hospital because I, no matter what, I was determined it was going to be done and um, sooner rather than later. Okay, and Emily, the doing your interview, we gave Emily the choice of whether she wanted to do it while she was in hospital. Or we were going to delay the process because Emily was a candidate that we wanted to um, make sure that we interviewed. So we were going to make the reasonable adjustment, but Emily insisted that she did it while she was in hospital. Um, it wasn't um, me as a recruiting manager saying to Emily, you've got to do it while you're in hospital. No, that 
it was Emily's choice. So Emily, what as an influencer, yeah, what how how has how has having a paid job changed your life now? And, oh, and what do you do in your role? It's changed my life so much for the better. Because even my mum didn't think I was going to get a paid job. I've made her proud. My auntie thought and probably still thinks I'm awesome. I now uh, I now campaign on things like pavement parking. And it was only the other day I was talking to Scott about campaigning for some... Because Barclays in Seaford is shutting and I'm... And I'm wanting to campaign to say things like, when you shut your branches, bank branches, um, it has an impact on people who have disabilities because um, either they can't access the bank on their own or they don't have the level of understanding to do it online. Yeah. It's about giving people the the thing the um things that they need and having the voice to actually say that yeah. thank you emily and emily just one more thing to ask you to all those employee employers out there today and um, what would be your final message for them to give them Believe in people with believe in people with disabilities because because they have a lot to show so, and it helps them believe in themselves too. So Emily is absolutely a fantastic ambassador. It makes me emotional to sit here to say this because I've seen her grow in confidence, not only over the last two years that she's been working with me on my program, but actually throughout my whole time at Seeability, um, she's she 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 she's passionate. She does what is right. She she's brave as well. Um, and actually, Emily has the skills. Uh, to to go even further in her career, and 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 Emily will go places. So Emily, it's all credit to you because you're doing what is right. So thank you for talking to me today, and over to you, Jane. Thank you so much, Scott and Emily. And um, I'm pretty sure that any employer watching this now will realise that here are two people that they would really benefit from employing. So you might get lots of headhunters coming for you, but you stay where you are, you're doing fine there. <laughs> and um, I think, you know, again, we look at your, both of you, the determination that you've shown to overcome, you know, bullying, to overcome recruiters who don't get it, to overcome stereotypes. The kind of drive and determination that you've shown is, um, you know, it, it, it's remarkable and lots of people without learning disabilities don't have that. And I think, you know, when we look at the kind of people that we want to employ in our organisations, we want people who are motivated and passionate and as talented as, as both of you are. And I know that there are many, many other people out there similarly with sight loss or with learning disabilities who also have a lot to offer employers, um, but don't always have the opportunity so for the employers out there, if you have any questions, uh, we've got about five minutes left. Um, be very happy to answer any questions that you've got. Um, we've already had a, a question asking Scott, actually, could you talk a bit more about the About Me profile that you use to help your colleagues to support you in, into work when you got into work? Because that's that's come up in the chat and it would be great to hear a bit more about that. Yes. Yeah, so. Thank you, Jane. Uh, yes, so I I use a thing called a one page profile, which is all about me. It 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 demonstrates, it tells people how to work with me, what my skills are, what I can, what how how I like to work, um, but also what are my hobbies as well. So it's those conversational starters to say to the person actually I'm not just here to 
I, I don't just have a learning disability or a visual impairment. I'm a person in myself. I'm a human being. So it is about knowing how to work with that person and to and and actually it's I I only developed that whilst I was at Seeability, uh, the one page profile, because of everybody went at Seeability was using it before I even got to Seeability. So I thought, well, I better have one too. And it just tells your colleagues and your managers the what way to see how to work with you and and the potential in you. Fantastic. And Emily, do you have a profile? Uh, Yeah, but I might get someone to help me rewrite it. Okay, because it'll need updating, won't it, as your skills grow? Yeah, because that was before I did the influence role. Right, okay. So you've gained lots of skills since then that need adding perhaps now. Sounds like I'm on a mission then. It does sound like you're on a mission. And um, one of the missions I wonder about is, do you think that every organisation should do what you've done and have these profiles so that we can all work together more effectively? Yes. Because we're all disabled at even break and we need to know how to work with each other because we all have different access needs. And it sounds like a really good way of making sure that we all know the best way to work with each other because that's going to bring out the best in everybody, isn't it? It is. I would say the profiles are so beneficial um, to know how to work with your colleagues and 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 it's and it supports colleagues to not be scared of asking the questions that might be the elephant in the room. Um, and but it's also about just saying actually let's be let 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 let's be let's just work like this from from the start and 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 let's continue to work like that it's about being open isn't it and and accepting and not not you know hiding things that we think are too scary to talk about because actually if we're all open and communicate then life gets so much easier i have a question for both of you what's your ambition scott what what would you where would you like to see yourself well I never thought I'd get to where I am now, so that's very lucky. Um, but actually, my ambition is to to run my own organisation eventually and to be a CEO. And um, but there's a long way to go on that. Um, but I would really like to learn those skills to be able to do that. Well, you say it's a long way off, but you're already a, a great recruiting manager because look at the talent you've recruited in Emily. So, you know, you're already, I, I, I think, you know, a good way there. But I'm sure Seeability won't want to lose you. Emily, what, what was your ambition? Where would you like to go next? Um, I don't know. But all I do know is that I'd like to do be able to do something like this to enable people to have a stronger voice. Fantastic. That's so important, isn't it? Because there's such a group of people, large group of people who just never get heard. And also, if they can't verbally communicate, they need to find a way around it. The people that that recruit others. Uh, Yeah, there's more than than one way to communicate, isn't there? Yeah. I think I think the other thing about this is, and I might start. This might start a bit of a debate here, uh, so apologies for that. Um, but actually, when you, as soon as you say you've got a learning disability, a visual impairment, or you've got autism or sight loss, people tend to back off and and not and 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 think, oh well, they just can't do it. But actually. We can, we, 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 we shown that today. We, yeah. we, I sit in the leadership team um, alongside Joni, and Joni's my colleague, um, one of my peer colleagues as well. And I bounce things off Joni, and she bounces things off me all the time. Um, and I do the same with Emily as well. 
it, it's about asking the right questions at the right time and and looking and doing a skills um and looking at everyone's skills and using those skills to the to to the to the to your advantage but also valuing the person from the heart it's having the right values to being able to achieve achieve all of this so if you've got the right values you want to make sure that everybody is being inclusive as possible everyone's walking the walk and talking the talk so it is about actually being looking at yourselves as an organizations and thinking uh, how we are we doing this right or, or are we not doing this right? Do we need to do something differently? Is there something we need to change? Um, and you're not always going to get it right for yourselves. Um, we, we're always learning at sea ability, but actually what we, what we strive to do is strive to achieve our goals and our values to being able to achieve everything that we do. Absolutely. And you can do that better when you recognise everybody's skills and use them. Because let's be honest, I mean, you've both said that you struggled with academic work. We don't need a world full of people who are academic. You know, we do need academic people and that's great. They can go off and be the scientists, but we need people in all sorts of roles. And other skills are just as valuable as academic skills. And we couldn't, you know, the world wouldn't go around without them. So it is about you know, looking at people's skills, valuing them and making the world accessible and inclusive so that those skills can thrive and contribute in the same way that, that anybody else can. Um, Claire's just commented uh, in the chat, it can be really hard to be honest about your disabilities. There are so many assumptions that people make about you, but I've recently been more honest and open than ever. And although it can be difficult initial conversation, it has changed the way I, I work and how I work with other people in my organisation. I think it is about the openness and honesty and, and not, as you said, Scott, not being the elephant in the room, being something that we talk about in the same way we might talk about the weather or what's on television. You know, it's just an everyday, everyday conversation. Yeah. Well, Sometimes company... it's hard to talk about the disability side of it, though, because the minute you mention disability, they they think you can't do it all we need sometimes is someone not to sit there and hold our hand but someone to sit there and guide us through what we're doing yeah yeah absolutely it's not hard is it it just means a no. bit, bit of extra support but once you've learned how to do it that's it you're you're able to do it then and i was going to say it's not rocket science no exactly it isn't but sometimes they need it in black and white like, yeah sometimes you it's almost like you have to write something like Yes, I have a disability, but I'm human and I can do. Yes, absolutely. And actually, when I met Emily previously, we did decide that if her career as an influencer didn't work out, she needs to be a stand up comedian because she's got an incredible sense of humour. So you might be the next Rosie Jones, um, which would be amazing. Um, we've run out of time. I'd like to thank everybody, particularly Joni and Scott and Emily, for being on the panel with us today, um, I have learned so much and I've all also come away with lots of ideas of things that we can do at even break that will be better for us. So thank you so much um, for all your input today. Um, thank you to Toby for helping behind the scenes, particularly when my uh, internet was dropping down and to everybody at Seeability for everything you do and to everyone who's been here today listening and contributing to the session. Just to let you know that our next Even Break Explores event is coming up. Even Break explores neurodiversity with Michael Vermeesh from Microsoft and Aidan Healy from Lexic. And that's on Wednesday, the 22nd of September at 2 p.m. So look out for invitations to that. But again, thank you very, very much um, for your participation today. And if anybody has further questions, um, just let us know. We can pass them on to Seeability. I'm sure they'd be very happy to answer any questions that you've got. And um, Thank you very much and hopefully we'll see you soon.